The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show. I'm your host, Charles Christian, and we've got another packed programme in featuring not one, but two interviews, plus a lot of other stuff as well. However, before we go any further, here's Janie with an exciting piece of news. Oh, yes, we're absolutely jumping up and down with excitement, aren't we? We are. We're giving ourselves little headaches almost. <laughs> I may have to go and have a lie down because <laughs> it's the Higgy Pop Paranormal Entertainment Awards again this hmm. year, 2019. And the exciting bit, of course, is Weird Tales Radio Show is one of the shortlisted nominees. Mm-hmm. So For the best podcast category. Absolutely. Best paranormal podcast category. Yes. And... Um, we wondered if you'd like to vote for us. We'd love you to we, vote we, for we us. We would love, <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. And, um, yeah, so, um, what? well, yes, there's an actual awards ceremony. I'll have to get a frock. <laughs> <gasps> I don't do frocks. <laughs> um, I'll go in my jumpers. No, anyway, so there's an awards ceremony. But... Now, here's a bit of a joke coming up. Of course, <laughs> quite a few of the nominees don't turn up because, of course, they're ghosts. <laughs> of some description. Or just spirits. I imagine there'd be a lot of spirits there. Well, there. <laughs> Champagne. <laughs> well, we'll be if we get. We will. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, so if anybody would be so lovely as to vote for us, they would need to know the link, which is go to www.higgypop that's h i g g y p o p dot com higgypop.com okay slash awards probably find it by just going to the site but you can go straight to the awards and um, you will find us there but i would just say this because because i obviously looked and popped me vote in there. Um, no, I didn't. No, I didn't do that. No, 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 no I didn't. No, 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 no. no. I just looked. I just looked. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, why is only my little vote? Anyway, um, the thing is that you see at the top a little box, and that is where you have to cast your vote. Um, and you do have to go through each category before you get to the best paranormal podcast. Weird Tales Radio Show mm-hmm. category to vote for us. But um, as you go through the categories, you can just click no preference if it's a category that doesn't interest you. Mm-hmm. And then you click away and you will come to the Best Paranormal Podcast, which is us. And we'll be there and you just pop a little vote in the little button and press vote. You've got all the info, just need to vote, please. And voting closes at midnight on Saturday, the 30th of November. So please vote. We'd really love it if you would. Thanks very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, the first of our interviews is with Darren Charles, who has an MA in history and has specialised on the early modern witchcraft trials in Scotland and the northeast of England. I interviewed Darren at the Fear in the Fens Festival, which took place in uh, Downham Market here in the Norfolk Fens in the middle of October. And uh, Darren, among other things, is one of the founder members of the Folk Horror Revival Group, which is generally 
promoting and developing interest in some of the darker and more interesting aspects of folklore. Then you went on into academic life, university, mm. studied history. Yeah. Yeah, and then you've done a master's degree in history, but focusing on the witchcraft trials. Yes, um, largely on, on the witchcraft witchcraft trials in, in the north east of England and Scotland and the kind of bleed between the two countries um, and how it, it sort of little bits of, of well, you had two countries with very different laws regarding witchcraft however there were, there were crossovers between the two in this region, in that region so um, in Newcastle for instance you have a the, the second biggest witch trial in England um, and the accuser is a Scottish witch pricker so, um, who was operating outside of his, his jurisdiction however he was invited down to, yeah. to do so and um, witch prickers that's uh, basically following the thing we've all seen with witch finder general and Matthew Hopkins um, yeah. testing to see if parts of when you poke a witch with a pin, whether it bleeds, but they tended to use retracting blades yeah. and sort of trickery. There's a great, a great scene in the film Witch Hammer, the Czech film, um, in which um, a, a, a woman is, is tested with a pin and you see the pin retract. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, there's no blood, she's a witch. Yes. So. Yeah, it's um, and it was it was an incredibly popular way of, of identifying people as witches in yeah. in Scotland at the time. Yes. And um, you were talking earlier uh, in the talk you gave um, that most of the witchcraft allegations weren't made by uh, people in authority. It was really neighbours and yeah. in some instances, members of the family, you know, let's get the old widow out of the property and have it for ourselves. Yeah, um, sort of low level squabbles within society, um, which kind of leads to, um, you can kind of see how there's a difference between England and Scotland without respect, because in, in England, um, they were tried in the size court Mm -hmm. which is uh, a centrally appointed judge would travel to, yes. to from out of the area yeah. to try the, the accused mm. and in Scotland it was it, it was a responsibility of the Privy Council but they would sort of put it in the hands of um, local lo lords and such like local church men yeah. and things. so in Scotland so many more were um, had local sort of like loyalties. Yeah. Um, whereas in England, there was no lo loyalty to local people, so they they were they were given a much fairer trial. Subsequently, there were less people less people um, executed, which is in England than in Scotland. Yes. I mean, you do read on <coughs> some of the witch trial accounts where the judges are basically throwing out the evidence as just preposterous mm. in some of the English trials. Um, tell us a bit more about the um, Newcastle ones, because we all tend to focus on Essex, East Anglia with Matthew Hopkins, mm. but that's, and, and also with the um, Witches of Pendle, mm. but the uh, Newcastle ones don't really seem to get quite so much there's not publicity not as much known about it um it is the second biggest witch panic in england after after the hopkins um yeah. case um and basically the, um a sort of puritan um ideal that there was a lot of sin going on in, in and around newcastle and they invited down a scottish witch pricker to test people and who it was put out, message was put out around the city, you know, come and tell us who, who you think's a witch. 
Um, and so people did. Yes. Um, and there were 30, 30 people accused and tried, um, 15 of whom were executed on the town mill. Mm. Um, uh, there was a, a one particular instance of a, of a quite well-to-do woman. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not very good with names. I can't remember the gentleman's name. Yeah. Um, but the witch pricker had, had, had said, oh, she's a witch. And there was a gentleman who was quite a, a significant local figure. Um, had mi insisted that she was tested again because he didn't believe it. And the second time, uh, she bled. Mm. And then, oh, she's not a witch. And she was... And he eventually is led, alleged to have chased the, uh, the, the witch pricker back to Scotland. Yes. Um, and there's, there's rumour that the witch pricker went back to Scotland and within a couple of years was, was hanged himself um, hmm. for fabricating uh, yeah. witchcraft cases. Yeah, because the Newcastle one, I think you said it was 1650 or...? Yes, yeah. 1650. So that's quite a bit later, almost 10 years later than Matthew Hopkins, wasn't um, he? Because he was 1640s period. 1645 to 47 Hopkins, oh, so right. three yeah, years bit, later. Yeah. But still quite significant, I think. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's not the records um, yeah. for the Newcastle case, which I think would be quite interesting if we did have all the records, mm. you know. Because, of course, with Hopkins, we've got his own, his own testimony, as it were, and we've got yeah. so many different court records because it was such spread over such a, yes. a, a, a sort of wide area. Um, so we've got a lot of records for that case, but... Um, and Pendle received a lot of attention as well, so there's a lot of records for that. Yeah. Even though Pendle's a much... P Pendle's a, a, I suppose, a lesser case than Newcastle. Mm. Slightly. Yeah. One thing that's obviously more than a coincidence mm. is that the big surges in witch hunting in the UK mm. followed and the changes of the, in the laws mm. followed the introduction of Protestantism mm. and initially um, following Henry VIII, uh, Edward VI was quite extreme and again during the Commonwealth, the Civil War period in the 17th century, again it was the Puritans. So we were, we're dealing with quite extreme Protestantism yeah. and the church in Scotland was also very extreme. Yeah, well, yes, yeah. 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 Um, in England, uh, I mean, uh, this is what allowed Hopkins to kind of rise up as the witch finder general. Um, there was a certain amount of lawlessness at the time hmm. with the ongoing um, struggles between the king and country sort yeah. of thing. Um, and so you've got two warring factions between Parliament and royalists and this is all going on at the same time but you've got this this puritan obsession with idolatry um so anything that relates to our false idols as they call them so sort of, that can be catholic yeah. um iconography or anything like that and all of that was well they, they attempted to destroy it mm. without mercy um and so anybody that believed in these things could be, you know, arrested and, and made, a, made an example of dreadfully sort of um, fractious time. And Hopkins was able to kind of rise up in the, in the background of all that and just um, under, under the guise of a, a sort of Puritan, hmm. puritanical sort of... I mean, I think he did genuinely believe that he was doing God's work. Um, he was reasonably well paid for it, but it, was, it wasn't, it was I don't think the pay was something that was life changing. So I don't think anybody would have possibly done it for, mm. purely for money. Mm. He obviously did believe what he was doing, um, both him and Stern. They were well educated men as well, so they weren't. Hopkins potentially was from a, a, a reasonably wealthy background anyway. Yeah. Um, so, who knows? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's intriguing that um, there wasn't the same 
obsession with witchcraft during the long Catholic period in English history. No. Which, you know, I mean, I think it was the, the Normans or the Saxons brought in the first witchcraft laws, mm. but in it, it was only a handful of people who were ever executed for yeah. it. It wasn't, it was, it was never a, an issue until um, much later on. Um, and it was, a, it was a rise in popularity of, for witch trials across Europe mm. during the 16th, 15th and 16th century. And it was, it was things like demonologies, malleus maleficarum, um, all those sorts of witchcraft pamphlets and things like that that kind of stirred up that unrest and panic. Mm -hmm. um, and that led to more accusations. And suddenly, you know, we, we, we get to a point where you've got the Hopkins case and all of these things happening. Um, and that's kind of the pinnacle in this country. I mean, Germany, or what we, what we call Germany now, is probably the mm. hotbed in, mm. in the 16th and 17th century of, of witchcraft trials. It's, it's absolutely rife. Um, and some parts of Europe, it, it was very little. Um, England was one of the lowest um, in terms of numbers. Um, and the, generally speaking, the, the Scandinavian countries mm. uh, and Italy. I, Italy and, Italy and um, Spain was more about heretics. Yes. There was a lot more he burning of heretics than there was of witches. Yeah. And actually, as well. In, but another interesting point, I suppose, is that some of the, certainly in some of the Scandinavian countries, there were more men than women at oh, various yeah. points were accused yeah. of witchcraft. It was seen, particularly in Finland, as a, as a male-dominated field, whereas throughout Western Europe, and, um, it was seen more as a female sort of rule. Yeah. Interesting point, I think. Yeah. What about the suggestion I've seen made that one of the issues was the medical professions, as we'd now call them, were getting organised and they saw it as competition from people going to old wise women for herbal treatments and the like and really wanted to protect their monopolies? I think possibly. Um, it's not really something I've ever gone too much into, the, the thing on medical side of things, but there is a I mean, there is a case that um, you had a lot of um, a lot of what we what we would now call cunning folk, mm -hmm. um, who people were using quite regularly for um, healing cures for for all kinds of things, and much much like we, today we use homeopaths, and mm -hmm. it a lot of the same ideas, but as as the end, sort of, it, it's more when the Enlightenment comes along that people start to change. Um, mm -hmm. Once once we get into the Enlightenment period, that's when people start to kind of look upon medicine and go, well, actually, that's not medicine, so we're, we're going to push that aside and say that we don't believe in that. Um, but it does it does pro proliferate on right into the 19th century, really. The cunning the cunning mm. folk. There, um, there are a number of um, cases sort of dotted throughout the, that century. As, mm. as, as more, more and more people move into cities, they kind of transplant those ideas with them. Right. So it's, I mean, even, even, even in London or yeah. other big cities in, in the sort of industrial era, there are people operating as cunning folk mm. um, and using traditional sort of remedies and things. Yeah. So it never it never goes away, but it does it does get frowned upon by the, the medical elites at some point. Yeah. And I say the same thing in what we'd now call veterinary science. That lasted even longer, well into the first half of the twentieth century, the sort of horseman's mm. guild type of oh, yeah. thing. Frog bone men and that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, you still hear of it today. It's well, you do, you do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it never went away, really. Mm. A little bit more underground, perhaps. Mm. But it's, 
it still hangs on. Yeah. And quite a few things sort of do come around again. Yeah. I mean, people are occasionally now, you, you're hearing more of people turn into old, old remedies for things. And mm. Sometimes they actually do have medicinal properties. And yeah, yeah. It's just people had, n had never really thought of them. Yes. Thought to, to test them for them. Yeah. And obviously, going way back, the remedies some of the uh, physicians and surgeons were handing out in the um, Middle Ages, you were more likely to die from them than going for, to the local cunning woman for a, a poultice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some of them are pretty grim. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm glad we're past quite a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. With the trials, hmm. am I right in thinking that the witches, people accused of witchcraft, they didn't have anybody to defend them? There were no um, sort of defence lawyers as such? N not as such. Um, sometimes you would get... Um, local dignitaries might step in if they... If they like the chap I was mm. talking about in the case of the, in the, new, the woman from yeah. Newcastle. Um, sometimes the church... Sometimes church people would say churchmen, um, priests would would step in and say, you know, there's no evidence of this. This is not this is not right. Mm -hmm. um, there are numerous um, accounts. There are just as many, possibly even more accounts of priests saying, yeah, she's a witch. Mm -hmm. But there are there are pr accounts of priests um, throughout throughout the, the early modern period saying that, standing up and saying, actually, no, mm -hmm. this is madness. There is no, the, the, you know. This isn't real. Mm -hmm. um, these people aren't witches, and there's quite a few, quite a few examples that I've, I've read over the years. Yeah. Can't think of any off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no. And um, yeah, and likewise, you mentioned it in your talk earlier, mm. but in England, most people, there's a handful of exceptions, but. The punishment was being hanged, um, and yes. it's it's on the continent and in Scotland that it was being burned at a stake. Yeah, um, it differs uh, from country to country. So some some countries, which is hanged, um, some countries they were burned at the stake. Scotland, they were they were meant to have their necks broken and then burned. Right, be strangled first. So yes, yeah. yeah. Not always, didn't always happen. Yeah. Sometimes they were burned alive. Mm. But the idea was that they were supposed to have their neck broken and then, then um, hanged. Uh, sorry, burned. Mm. Um, but it just depends on, on whereabouts you lived in yeah. Europe as to how, how, how it was dealt, dealt with. Yeah. Um, the Germans, Germany was, was um, particularly right for, for burnings. Mm. Pretty much, I think they were pretty much the worst for it, really, yeah. by quite a long way. Yeah. Um, France, not quite so much. France was sort of somewhere between between England and, and mm. Germany in terms of the numbers. Yeah. Um, I say the Scandinavian countries, there's not a lot. Yeah. And they generally the Scandinavians, I think, off the top of my head, the Scandinavian countries were mostly hanging. Yeah. And in France, their big witchcraft scale, most celebrated one was Le Voisin, wasn't it? The, in the 17th century, which was a sort of court scandal where various women were selling mm. beauty treatments, yeah. doing procuring abortions, doing all ver manner of things, and then somebody used poison from one of them to poison her husband so she could marry somebody else and it was a, a big... Yes, it was, yeah. yeah. It's not a, a, something I, I know a great deal about. Yeah. But, um, and I, I'm not entirely sure of the dates for that either, but um, I do have a, a... Yeah. I think I know about as much as you do there. <laughs> What's the current thinking on the numbers 
that actually died because you do have some people talking about it being the burning times and talking about you know almost genocide on the continent mm. whereas then in as ever, there's a revision view that it wasn't that many and it was in thousands rather than tens or hundreds of thousands. And obviously in the UK, yeah. it was hundreds of... Yeah, uh, um, yeah there's a, there was a, a, an opinion that went on to millions, um, which has been largely discounted. We, th we think somewhere in the region of 60,000, all mm -hmm. told. Mm -hmm. um, which is still, you know, yeah. a, a, a huge figure, um, but the long way short of nine mm. million. <laughs> yes, nine million to sixty thousand. I think. Yes. Was. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can't say anything for sure because we just don't have the records for yeah. a lot of countries, so we don't know mm. um, for sure. But um, general, I think um, predictions are probably sixty to ninety thousand. I think, mm -hmm. which seems a bit more. Yes. Believable and a bit more realistic. Than and this was over a period of what, 150 was, was years? Over about 150 years. Yeah. yeah. So. And obviously, point for listeners, what is now Germany was in those days mm, dozens of separate yeah. states, yeah. which is also one of the reasons why there's no real evidence left because the states have vanished yeah. and that thing. What about in the UK, the Scotland versus England in terms of numbers? Um, a lot more, a lot more per head in Scotland. Yeah. It was a lot more rife in Scotland down to a variety of different methods. Uh, first off, you, you have two very different um, legal right. systems dealing with it. In England, we have the Assize Rick Courts, so um, they were imprisoned awaiting trial. And every six months, an Assize judge who was centrally appointed would arrive and um, try everybody yeah. who was sat waiting. Now, he had no, no loyalty to anybody within that community, so you would expect a generally honest appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas in Scotland, in a lot of instances, the Privy Council would allow uh, local lairds and local churchmen and local business people, sort of the, the, the kind of local elites, mm -hmm. um, to make those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. So they obviously have loyalties to, to people that work for them or mm. people who they're friends with. Mm. Um, so you, you, you saw a lot more um, cases of people being, yeah, being uh, convicted. Convicted. Yeah. 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 Mm. So. Any idea on what the total in Scotland, the sort of death toll was? Oh, no. no. Uh, but it was it was considerably more than in England. Yeah, I do know that. It's like one in one in. It was a in a population, it was something like 4% of the population. And then the trials petered out, as you said, when the Renaissance yeah, came was, along. Was, uh, well, 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 not the you know, the Age of Enlightenment, not the Renaissance. We had, we, we had new, new witchcraft laws in the, in the early 18th century, um, and that the, the interest in... in um, the Enlightenment and learning seemed to throw a lot of superstition out the window. So we, we, have, we have a big sea change once we get into the 18th century. And people stop believing. Mm. Um, they start to rely more heavily on science. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, these things still proliferate, even though... Um, even though we have the changes, mm. but you know, they're still there. But we're, we're we're talking about them less. We're seeing less ex less examples, um, and they do over those next couple of hundred years. They they peter out, um, and it's not until the 20th century that we really well late 19th century that we kind of see things 
picking up again as it becomes more of an interest in, in the occult. Hmm. Around about the mid mid 19th century, I think onwards, things start to um, popularity in the occult. Oh, so spiritualism. Spiritualism, and um, you, then you start to get things like the Golden Dawn and yes, all of that, which uh, kind of changes things. Yeah. Hmm. And theosophy. Yes. Yeah. Any particular lessons you've observed from your study of witchcraft? Um, I think it's really that we should just let people believe what they want. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, who, who are we to say what somebody else should or shouldn't believe? Mm. You know, we have all, we all have our own thoughts on, on spirituality and religion. And I think it doesn't harm anybody. Mm. If you don't, if you're not harming anybody, then why should you be, you know, castigated for it? Mm. Well, I think that's a very good Same. point to end. So, Darren, thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thank you. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Here's an odd little story I spotted. The version I saw was in the 14 Times, but it's also been in uh, UK and American newspapers. And it's the fact that Mattel, the people behind the Barbie doll, have brought out a new special edition version inspired by Mexico's traditional Day of the Dead. The doll uh, is based on the famous Katrina character drawn by the cartoonist Jose Guadalupe Posada in 1912. Uh, she has the skeleton face paint, uh, black gown decorated in marigolds, butterflies and skulls, and it's available for $75.00. Not sure of its UK availability, but probably similar pricing these days, given currency rates. And needless to say, the appearance of Day of the Dead Barbie has not gone down entirely well. Some people are calling it cultural appropriation. Others are calling it a rip-off. Anyway, Day of the Dead Barbie. Really can't say any more than that. And now for our second interview, and this is with Maxine Sanders, and this is a not-to-be-missed event. Uh, Maxine, dubbed the Queen of the Witches, together with her husband Alex Sanders, were leading exponents of witchcraft in the UK in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, they were behind what's now become known as Alexandrian witchcraft. They effectively helped bring witchcraft above ground, bring it out into the open and expanded its horizons to the greater public. And I would say we're very pleased to have uh, Maxine here because she rarely gives interviews. And uh, this interview also took place at the Fear in the Fens Festival. And if you notice a little bit of odd music in the background, that's because in a room below where we're doing the interview, there was a horror movie playing. As happens. So the first question is, when you first got interested in Wicca, the craft... How did that start? I mean, you would have been a teenager. Was it one of these things that you do lots of things when you're a teenager? You think, cool, this will be fun. Um, but you're not really taking it seriously. And then you became engrossed in it because, I mean, it's effectively become your life's work, hasn't it? Mm. Very much so. Um, but how did I become interested in it? I didn't. I, I was brought up a Catholic a convert to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but my mother was an occultist. Ah, oh, right. And so um, when my mother invi invited Alex Sanders to Sunday tea, mm -hmm. you know, she used to hold these soirees on a Sunday, and um, I was really 
cross, which dreadful one. I mean, I was only 13. Mm -hmm. When I first re-met Alex, she'd yes. known him when I was a child. And um, he was the most inoffensive man, kind, kind-eyed. Um, there was nothing radiating from him that was suspicious or nasty. And if you asked him a question, he was straightforward in his answer. There was nothing creepy about him, as you would, or as mm. I imagined it would be. Um, I was already involved with Subud and Gurdjieff and the mysteries, mm -hmm. Egyptian mysteries, even though I was a practicing Catholic. I, don't, I think I'd lost the devotion to the church. I, I begrudged going to the Mass on a Sunday. But that's a teenage thing. Mm. Um, but my mother had invited this witch, and he came, and I found him fascinating, and he became a regular visitor. And I found it most odd that he, his knowledge of Christianity, um, angelic forces, demonic forces, not in a frightening way, mm -hmm. but just his knowledge, his study, and, um, and then when he started, of course, everybody asked him questions about witchcraft. And I'd sit there very shy, listening, and everything sort of made sense. It was, there was nothing bad about it. In, indeed, it was, it was open, mm -hmm. but there was no guilt. There was no sin in as much as... Um, you were your judge, and if you became an initiate, uh, it was following your spiritual aspirations and desires almost to be able to work the magic, to, to learn to work how to work witchcraft. Not sticking pins in people as mm, people mm, imagined, mm, mm. even though we do, mm. but not for bad purposes, yes. usually from an acupuncture point of view. Yes. <laughs> um, so... That was, that was it. That's how it happened. And I became an initiate on the 10th of November. I can't remember which year it was now. Um, and I wanted to tell the world. It was... It continued. And most witches after their initiation feel this. And I was told to be very quiet, even though all the publicity came. Yes. You know, uh, what you do for the public arena or the camera... It's quite different to what you do within your circle. Mm, mm. So that's yeah. sort of, if you can condense two or three years down, yes. that's what it was. I became more and more involved and fascinated. I don't deny for one moment that I wasn't fascinated. I was. Um, and still I am. Mm -hmm. that, that, that must be... Well, being polite to say how many years, but I mean... About 55. 55 years, yes. And are you still studying, still learning? Oh, you never stop learning. In fact, the more I learn, the more I know how little I know. <laughs> and I do. When I meet people, like I met somebody here today, and just in a moment or two uh, sentences, this person... The knowledge, I can't wait to meet them again. Mm -hmm. You know, just and it, it is, you never stop learning. Mm -hmm. You can never say, I know, I yeah. know it all. You, you don't. You get glimpses or, or you practice, like, you know, I spoke to one lady and I, I knew there was something the matter with her. And, but that's habit. You yes. know, I've done it so many times, I can see the signs. There's nothing magical about it, no, nothing sensitive about it. I just see the signs. Yeah. Um, and so you immediately go to my job, I'm a priestess. My job is when somebody comes and asks me for help, or even doesn't ask me for help, but I know they want it, then it's my job to give that help. Hmm. And that, about always learning, does bring us back to one of the questions that was asked about the future of the craft and the fact that so many people now read up on it on the internet and that's it. I'm a practicing witch <laughs> and <laughs> I can do it all or anybody can anybody tell me by tomorrow night how to hex my neighbors and so on. Um, 
that does seem to be a growing concern, I think, among people, that, that there's this sort of instant gratification desire for people who want to be, mm. want to be witches. And you know, it's not just witchcraft. I mean, there's this um, sense of self-entitlement that people have in all walks of life. It's just that witchcraft it just seems the easy, easy way to do it. Mm. Uh, my experience tells me that when they do this, they do get burnt mm. in perfectly normal ways, but it puts a stop on it. Then they get insane you know, and get committed. Yeah. Um, but they don't anymore. We've shut down the uh, hospitals, which is so sad. And, you know, I have very strong opinions regarding uh, the mentally sick. The occult is dangerous. Don't dabble in it. They were right. Mm. When those Christians were right when they said, don't dabble in it. Where they were wrong was when they said they're devil worshippers. Yeah. That's where they were wrong. It is dangerous and you need a good teacher. Yeah. And for someone starting out today, how would they find a good teacher as oh. opposed to... God, that's the toughest question ever. <laughs> the craft is, is, has been its own... It, its success has been an enemy because so many people... And yet they don't. I mean, you know, when I hold soirees and they come to my home and it's, an evening, it's very relaxed and they come and ask questions, um, actually, you can have a room full of people, say 10 people. Mm -hmm. Not one of them will ask for initiation, they're just curious. But maybe mm -hmm. that's because I'm down to earth and tell it as it is. Mm -hmm. But there are others that don't and people become initiated and they, they get burnt. Um, I've forgotten your question, I'm sorry. No, no, you're answering it. No, but I mean, you know, the point about getting burnt, I've seen people say all this, you know, threefold law of return, that doesn't exist, it doesn't apply to me. Oh, I, and, and, I mean, it's, I it's, think, basic, it's basic karma, isn't it? Really? I think it's basic karma, but also I think it's reactive. You know, mm. we can put all these names to one side. And if I smack you yeah. now, you're going to take real offence. Yes. And even if you don't smack me back, you're going to go home and you're going to say... <laughs> and you're going to build up a certain amount of energy and hatred. That energy and hatred, I'm sorry, it has power. Mm. It really does. And it, once you're trained how to use it, and some people, 100 people hexing their neighbour, most of it won't work, but one will. Mm. And then they'll get the backlash from it because they don't know how to protect themselves from it. Mm. And I strongly advise people not to hex their neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> We've got enough trouble with bad relations all around at the moment. You know, yes. everybody, there's a there's that lack of care, lack of love mm. um, that's happening at the moment. And people will jump on that bandwagon of, I want to hex so-and-so. They're doing. I mean, when Trump mm. got in, these people said, I'm a witch, I'm going to hex yep, yep. The last thing a witch does is tell anybody that they're working. Yes. We know how to keep secrets. Well, there does appear to be a difference between those who are quietly getting on with it and those who appear to come from nowhere and immediately become media stars. They, uh, they're fascinated, I think. I think they fall into that trap of um, wanting to be... It, it's a, it's psychologically, it's... Um, they know they can burn very brightly. They know they can shine very brightly, but they're not... That power within them, that desire in, within them to achieve is not being given to them by their teachers because of the lack of teachers. Mm -hmm. They're not focusing. So what's the next best thing? Ah, oh, jump on the bandwagon. This is a good way to get an interview. Yes. Um, and, yeah. Uh, what can I say? Get on with it. <laughs> it's up, I think it's up to the interviewer to turn around and say, actually, I don't want to carry on this interview. <laughs> you know, they, they have a certain responsibility. And I think, I think the press and people who are interviewing and are relay, relaying facts to the public have become more discerning. Mm. 
mm -hmm. to what they were. It still goes on. You still get the horrible newspapers, anything for a, mm. a sale. Um, and if you look at the news of the world, that went out of business eventually yes. and so on. Yeah. And people are demanding... Karma. <laughs> yeah, people, exactly. It's, it happens. Whether you call it karma or threefold return, there is an energy that happens and it is better that you become a better person so you receive good things into your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, again, if you were interested, where would you start? As you're saying, there there are a lack, a there's a lack of yes. teachers. Yeah. And I advise people when they come and they say, how do I? I say, go and knock on every witch's door that you know. Yeah. If they hold an evening or they're going to meet you, always make sure that somebody knows because there are some bad people out there. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I say, don't go alone. Um, and go by your gut instinct. Yeah. You know, listen to us. Don't be afraid of asking questions. You know, is sex demanded? Because some groups, I mean, there's some really... Uh, yes. It's not witchcraft, it's... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a different level completely, but they, they use it yes. as a way. So ask the questions, don't be afraid. And if, if they say, I can't tell you that, it's a secret, walk away. Mm -hmm. There's nothing... Yeah, you know, I'm going to. If you say, well, "What? What are you going? What? What ritual did you do the other night? Or what ritual are you going to do?" And I'm going to say, "Well, Halloween's coming up. I'm going to do the ritual, and uh, I'm going to open the circle that those that have gone before can make their presence known, and they can come and share bread with us. Um, and that's all I'm going to tell you. I'm mm. not going to tell you how I do it. Yeah. I'm not going to go into details, but I'm telling you because you've asked me, and. Every witch and every teacher that's worth the salt will answer you. If they say, I don't know, they usually say, but I'll try and find out for you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's lovely. So it is go and experience, but trust yourself. You yeah. know, we all have, we've all got that inner knowledge, that inner sensitivity that says this is right. And this is right for me. This is the right person. This is the right group for me. You know, it might only be for a year, and then you might want to go on to... Like, just recently, I received a, a letter from somebody who's been an initiate uh, who needs further training. Their group wasn't able to give it to them. So she's searching. She's searching for a different group. And a good group will let you go if a group says, no, you can't go. Uh-uh. Mm. You walk out the door. Yeah. There's no such things. You take an oath in the craft, and that is to the craft. It's not to a group, and yes. it's, it's not to any individual. And so there are no bonds. There are no bonds. No. Right. No. I. I. I, I, I was repeating that because I, I wasn't aware of that. that. So, you, 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 when when you take the oath, it is to the whole concept of it rather than to a specific organisation or coven or group or whatever you like to call it. In, in Alexandria, that's in Alexandrian witchcraft. Yes. And we say in our initiation, uh, you come to go, uh, come and go as your conscience dictates. There are other aspects of witchcraft that don't have that. Mm -hmm. But Alex and I, um, we totally believed in that freedom of spirit and soul and body, that if you wanted to go, it was your conscience. No bonds would be put upon you to stay, and it won't in the good Alexandrian coven. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. Maxine, thank you very much indeed. Oh, it's been such a pleasure today. <laughs> thank you. Now, I do like a ghost hunt as much as the next person. Though I'm not one for all the gadgets that are used these days. I'm more for hanging round spooky churchyards until you feel the hair on the back of your neck rise or, worst case scenario, feel the bony hands of some skeletal claw coming out of a tomb to grab you on the shoulder. Anyway, this is a little tale of mine uh, when I helped 
I suppose, say, <laughs> layer ghost. Uh, it was during the early 1980s when I was living and working in London and dabbling in a little computer consultancy work. Uh, this was back in the days of the early personal computers when PCs didn't have hard drives and both machine operating systems and software had to be booted up from floppy disks. And um, some of those floppy disks really were, the four and a, five and a quarter inch ones really were floppy. Anyway, I was having lunch with the managing director of one of the UK's leading legal publishers at an Italian restaurant in Fleet Street. He was picking my brains because I also used to write about the law uh, while I was picking up my spaghetti. Uh, this is the adage that uh, there really is no such thing as a free lunch. Incidentally, it was also about this time I realised the phrase dynamic legal publisher was an oxymoron, but that's a story for another day. Anyway, he happened to mention that one of his offices was having a problem with a computer and uh, would I be able to help? Uh, the problem was, first thing on a morning, the computer, uh, I say this was back in the days when a small office might only have one computer, certainly there'd be no network. Anyway, the computer wouldn't work properly, but after a couple of hours, it would then suddenly begin functioning properly. But then, come the next day, same problem reoccurred. Didn't start, and then it did start. Uh, they had checked out the computer hardware. There wasn't a problem there. They checked out the software. There wasn't a problem there. Um, on the floppy disks, um, couldn't find any issue. Uh, but uh, the issue wouldn't go away. He added, because he knew I had an interest in the occult, um, I had actually tried to pitch him a book about um, the laws against witchcraft and magic, which he didn't want, which is a good idea because it meant I didn't have to write it. Anyway, I said I'd have a look. And uh, before we departed from lunch, which would have been about 4.15, uh, this was in the days when people still had long, long alcohol fuel lunches, the managing director confided in me and this would have been possibly the wine talking, that there was a rumour that the office, which was located in an old building on Carter Lane, which is near London's St Paul's Cathedral, was haunted. And it had even been suggested that the, perhaps the ghost objected to the introduction of new technology into an office that probably hadn't otherwise been updated much since Victorian times. Mm-hmm. Ghost in the machine, eh? Anyway, a couple of days later, I visited the office in the morning and found, just as I'd been advised, the computer took at least an hour, sometimes longer, before it functioning as properly. And it was also fair to say that some parts of the office were gloomy in a distinctly spooky way. Now, if the computer hardware and software was working OK, that left only one obvious, natural, as distinct from supernatural, variable to consider, and that was human error. So I had the staff describe their daily routine, which on the face of it seemed perfectly normal, with nothing screaming out, human error. Uh, you know, they switch on the computer, insert the floppy disks, and so on. So we agreed that the next day I'd be at the office when it opened up, so I could observe their routine in operation. And there it was. Not a ghost, but a great big steel safe that had probably been in the building since the 19th century. What the staff were doing every evening at the end of the working day was to store the floppy disks in the safe, as they knew it, it was a secure, fireproof location. And there the disks would remain for around 16 hours until the safe was reopened again in the morning. What the staff hadn't realised, and why should they, was the difference between the room temperature of the office and the coolness of the interior of the safe meant that overnight condensation formed on the magnetic surface of the floppy disks. And this was what was causing the floppy disks' drives to be unable to read them the following morning. Uh, they couldn't get a clear reading because it was being interfered with by the condensation. However, given it an hour or two for the condensation to evaporate and the disks were back to their normal operating temperature. So, mystery solved. No ghost. But it was a nice story and I got another lunch. 
And that's it. Almost out of time, but as ever, I'm going to squeeze in one last story. And this is actually uh, a question and answer I found in Marshall Julius's Vintage Geek book. Uh, we in interviewed Marshall Julius a couple of episodes ago. And it's, what's the name of Henry's that's Henry Frankenstein's hunchback assistant in the Frankenstein movies. And uh, most people think it's Igor, but it's not. In the original version of Frankenstein, 1931, with Boris Karloff as the monster, the character was called Fritz. And in The Bride of Frankenstein, although it was the same actor, a certain Dwight Fry playing the hunchbacked assistant, his name had changed to Carl. Yeah. And then there was another assistant in The House of Frankenstein, 1944, but his name was Daniel. Again, not Igor. Why do most people believe Frankenstein's hunchback lab assistant is called Igor? Well, not really sure, because... Mary Shelley's original novel features neither a hunchback nor a lab assistant nor any character called Igor. And in fact, the best known example of a hunchback lab assistant, played by Marty Feldman in the 1974 version of Young Frankenstein, the Mel Brooks movie, um, that was the first one where he was actually called Igor all the way through the film. Although, just to confused matters. His name was pronounced Igor. And there you go. Anyway, just remains for me, Charles Christian, to say thank you very much for listening. Please tune in again wherever you're listening, same time next week. And until then, stay well, stay different. Good night. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of The Weird Tales Radio Show. Good night. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.